Dimela Saobona Sakpase Namaste Upshin Dubra Ota Asalam Alaikum Hotep. Welcome to another episode of the Doria Laria Show. This is season two, episode 34. Who knew we can get this far? My name is Doria Lennon Laria of Laria's Education and Resource Network, where I plan seeds to help you grow. And we are live. We're live. And my phone is telling us we're live. Welcome to another episode uh, where I invite inspirational leaders who impact, influence, and inspire people to live life a little better than they did yesterday. I want to welcome to the show one of my college mates. And so you will see this only one time. This is our mascot. This is our camel. Yes, I'm a proud uh, alum of Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut. Shout out camels. And I decided to engage in a conversation with one of my peers about things that people keep. They get, they keep, they collect. And then at some point, someone says, oh, just give that away. It doesn't mean anything. When in actuality, it actually has a high price value. Who do you go to? What do you do? My guest tonight, Victoria Shaw, is an art appraiser. Art appraisers, not just things that are on the wall, but sometimes things that you may sit on, things that may you, you may use as you're doing work around the house, but it actually has value. So Victoria Shaw is an art appraiser and advisor in New York City. She works with families and individuals with art and personal property. Think estate sales. No matter what the time of the year, sometimes it may be spring when you're doing your spring cleaning, it's a good, it's always a good time to get organized and figure out what to donate, what to sell, or what to give to another family member. But maybe you want to check before you do that. Remember, the antique show, road show, does not come to your home. Please welcome Victoria Shaw. Hi, Doriel. Thank you for having me. Yay! Welcome, Yay. welcome, welcome. <laughs> so there might be some uh, some little terminology that actually comes from our college that you'll hear during this episode because we just can't help it. We just can't help it. We love camels. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, who will be live and on the replay. I'm going to ask two things. Of course, that you get uh, uh, some something to write on and, of course, bring bring your mug because we do a lot of sipping on this show. So get <laughs> And um, also, I'm going to invite my stream team, who is always here and ready to help, to jot down certain things in the chat, whether it be a question or a comment that you think is extremely poignant to the conversation. And of course, is as it comes in, I'll fly it up on the page. And of course, we're on Facebook and YouTube, so I look forward to having all of my community and with us. And both of us live in New York City, and so if you hear Chuck's passing by. <laughs> <laughs> I live down the street from a firehouse, so even better, <laughs> even better. So <laughs> love, love, love to have you. Uh, so we already have some people in the building. I thank you so much for joining us. Please drop and let us know where you're from. And especially if you are from CC, if you're from Khan College, you need to let us know your class. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let me just tell, let's just sort of hop into why I even got into this conversation. A couple of months ago, um, this actually started a couple of years ago with seeing Black Panther movie. And very quickly, I'll just recap what happened. I, I see the Black Panther movie. Everybody's like, oh, it's amazing. But there was one little part of the movie that had to do with Killmonger who goes into the museum and is looking at a piece of art and the curator at that time misspeaks about the worth and the originate the place that it originated from he knew more than she she thought she knew and then he sort of you know went to the next part if y'all know the movie then you know the movie and so i got into a conversation actually with another one of my uh college mates and she was talking about becoming an art curator and the path that it takes, the path that you have to take. And I was really fascinated by that. And, you know, I'm always looking out for how does this impact the community? And I said, well, wow, how many of our families actually would encourage and support a young person to go or to, first of all, study art history, 
um, and then to go through the path of doing an internship and maybe doing some traveling and studying art. But the the ROI doesn't really, quote unquote, pop off very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so here it is, we move to 2022 and um, a number of people are sort of just coming out of being at home or if you're a part of the sandwich community or sandwich uh, generation like I am, taking care of elders and also taking care of children. A number of us have popped into a more than one storage facility, mm-hmm. attic, <laughs> yeah. basement. And we're surrounded by all this stuff that we really don't know. What do we do with it? And so Victoria pops up and we get into this conversation. I'm like, oh my goodness, this would be perfect. So Victoria, how did you get into this? What fascinated you? Yeah. Well, tell me about art appraisal. I mean, I, I grew up around... Um, family members who really liked antiques, for instance. And the reason why they liked antiques, frankly, is because in the 70s, it was very cheap and easy to buy English and Victorian furniture, you know, old mahogany furniture at auction, you know, and so they would just pick things up at auction. Um, They were really smart buyers. And it was just, frankly, just because they were furnishing a home. And uh, so I, I grew up around that. I was always really interested in it. I loved going to museums. I started taking art history when I was in 10th grade. I went to that kind of a high school that gave me that opportunity. And more often than not, I just found myself really just wanting to learn about everything. Just be having a level of curiosity that was slightly abnormal, I'd say, for, you know, a, like a 12 year old. You need I, mean, I remember one time I walked into my dad's house and he and his wife, I mean, my stepmother had bought this 19th century silver chest, you know, which is, you can tell it's the form. It's very tall and it has very, very small drawers. It's very narrow and very tall. And I just walked in and I said, oh, that's a silver chest. And they just looked at me like, how did you know that? You're 12. <laughs> so it was just like this weird thing. I was just like picking up little bits of information as I went along. And then I was fortunate to uh, read this book called What Color Is Your Parachute? I couldn't decide if I wanted to go to law school or do something completely different. And I ended up doing the completely different thing, which was work for an auction house. And my first job at this auction house, because they had estate sales every two weeks, my job was pretty much just to unpack boxes and put labels on things and group things up into lots so that they could be sold as group lots. You know, And that could be like silver or porcelain or glass. So I got really, really good at the, at the objects and the the things that just end up in an estate where people are like, I don't know what to do with this. Just pack it all up, send it to auction. Wow. And then of course my personal interest in contemporary art had to do with the fact that I had young kids. We would take them to museums. We would always go to contemporary art museums because that will grab a kid in a way that I don't think necessarily traditional art does because it's, it's, it just happens to engage the viewer in just a different way, particularly anything that's conceptual. So I remember taking my kids a lot to Mass Mocha which is in the Berkshires. Um, It's an amazing museum. And just really just realizing that this is just a part of my life. And then just gradually, you know, I was working for Christie's, the auction house. I worked for more than one auction house. So I started in the little auction house, then I went up to Christie's. And then I also ended up, um, you know, working for startups, art related startups. And that's been a very interesting, interesting trajectory because in the beginning they were, when the internet was just starting to be used, Mm -hmm. We used in the auction house primarily as a way to source uh, old auction records. And I remember there was this company called Artifact. And this is back in the day when I was working at Christie's, we would have this subscription. They would send us these floppy disks and we would put them in a computer and be able to read old auction records. And it just like blew our minds because the way we used to have to research old auction records and research the history of the art market for a particular type of object, we'd have to just pick up old catalogs and thumb through them, which is, of course, incredibly inefficient and huge, huge time suck. So what ended up happening is the internet really did change the art world. And it, it changed the way we interact with it because there's more data that's available through the internet. You can look at old auction records, you can look at upcoming auction records, you can see gallery shows, museum shows, you have it all there and you don't even necessarily have to go in person. You can just see it all from your home, which is really helpful, I think, for people wanting to have an interaction with art, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily even in your home. It's just like the museums that you go to or visit online. It just begins this whole conversation that people need to start having, I think, in their families from a young age about like, why is art important? Why do you like this? Why do you hate it? You know, let's have a conversation about why it's, why it even exists. Like why did the artists create create this? And so I got into this world through 
the auction side of things and just having a family that was always picking up antiques at auction. And then I think what, what really changed things around for me was the fact that the internet made the art world completely shift. And now it's at the point where basically what we're all doing now is we're all just trying to figure out things as we go about how, you know, how the art world is impacted by the internet is also really interesting. Instagram has really changed the art world as well, because the fact <laughs> is, is that people are looking at art in the palm of their hand literally all day long. And so, that's a really, really interesting shift as well. Can I ask a question about that? How does, how, has, how have museums been impacted by, I never thought about that, by Instagram, because people are in essence looking at art all day long. Like, ha has there been a downshift? I mean, I think if anything, um, Instagram has only helped uh, museums stay relevant and stay in people's minds. I mean, I follow all the major museums on my Instagram. I follow art dealers. I follow artists. I follow art critics. I get a lot of my art related news from Instagram, oddly enough. Wow. I know that sounds crazy. I mean, of course, I would get an email. My inbox is full all the time just from the sub publications that I subscribe to, like Artnet, Art News. But if an artist dies, for instance, I immediately see it on Instagram because people start posting these like memoriams to the artist and like a picture of their face. I'm like, oh no. You know, that's how I found out about like, you know, for instance, I mean, not that she was an artist, but I found out about Queen Elizabeth's death first on Instagram because I just am on that more than I'm looking at my inbox during the day. You know, it's crazy. Um, but no, that's, that's, but the, but the reality is, is that Instagram has completely changed um, things. In fact, there's an auction curated this week. I'm going to the opening on Thursday night. It's, um, an, it's an artist who's also an art critic. She makes memes making fun of the art world. And what she's done is she's put together an auction for Sotheby's so that the artists that are sort of like in her world of Instagram, right. she's created just based on suggested algorithms set, fed to her by Instagram. She's selected some of those artists and she's putting them into an auction at Sotheby's. So that's fascinating how like Instagram has affected the art marketplace and how it's going to continue to affect it. <laughs> Um, but I, just, I discover new artists all the time through Instagram. It's an amazing platform for artists. I follow them. They follow me. I see what, you know, I see what other things that they're, you know, into. It's, it's fascinating, you know. Um, but I mean, I, I do this, you know, 24 seven, like I'm constantly looking at art, you know, so it's. So how, <clears throat> so the fact that you said, and I'm, I'm just amazed that you worked at Christie's like, those people, I, I have a little bit of information about art, but I know Christie's and I know Sotheby's. Yeah. Those are the places I know. Yeah. Uh, of course, the museums is as well. But whenever I, now I'm, I'm a person when I go to a museum and I see something and you, t you can tell me what it is, if it's, ex I don't know if it's expressionist or it's not cubist, but let's say let's, I see like a, a splotch. God help me. The painting that some dog did years ago and it was like a dog that just i don't know what the it, what it was but some dog like just put i don't know, like paw prints or something or like through paint so and if anybody knows what i'm talking about please like go find it and then like send it to me in the comments and someone was like oh my gosh that's worth like twenty five thousand dollars i said for what of course i think okay. art is subjective but help yeah. me out how do people say this is worth this okay well here's the problem i mean you know everybody you can ask whatever you want whether or not it's going to sell is the real question. Okay. I mean, people will say, well, this is, this is the price tag. Well, are you, is that even achievable? I mean, not everything that you see at auction will find a buyer. There's, a, there's something called a bought in lot. It's bought in by the auction house because it doesn't meet the reserve. Oh. People, people will, will go to an art fair. Sometimes the booth will completely sell out. Sometimes the booth will sell nothing at all. And the dealer has put all this money into having a booth renting a booth, mounting an exhibition within the booth, within the art fair and sell nothing. I mean, it's, it's a, it's very, very risky. It's a very risky business for art galleries. Um, auction houses have, uh, you know, a formula, you know, they have to really, really focus on what sells. They can't take any chances. That's why I'm so fascinated with this auction that's happening on Thursday. I mean, they have a lot of respect for the, her name is Jerry Gagosian and that's actually her, her pseudonym. It's not her real name, but she, um, 
has so many followers and she does such amazing things that she's got such a great eye that I've already previewed it online. It's an amazing auction, but I'm going to be fascinated to see how it does, you know, what actual things it's going to sell for how much that's going to be the really interesting part. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have a number of people who are watching. And I'm really excited about that. Please share this out. And of course you are, if you are from the camel community, if you're from the herd, then of course tag some people who are also Khan College students, our uh, Khan College alum, and uh, as well as those people who are art enthusiasts. If you're an art enthusiast, if you're not an art enthusiast, but your parent, your grandparent, your great grandparent gave you something or passed it down through the family and said, hold on to this. And at this point, your house, your attic, your storage unit is just full and you're like, I got to get rid of this before you do that. Because the road show is not coming to you. <laughs> you might want to contact a person like Victoria because she will be able to tell you about the piece, tell you the period and what it is worth. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about that. How do you do that? I mean, basically what I usually do with, with people when they reach out to me, I just say, let's start with some photos. And if you take good photos and you have a list and it's a list that shows the artist's names, you know, we're way ahead of the game. I mean, very often people can't, can't tell me the name of the artist because they can't read the signatures. Some artists, it's just a scrawl. I, you know, I'm familiar enough with many signatures, even if they're illegible to you, I can probably figure them out. Um, and so we usually just start with the photographs and then, um, you know, if I have additional questions or it really requires like an on-site visit, I'll go and I'll do the on-site visit. I'll put a, put together the list, take photographs of everything and produce a, an appraisal report. Sometimes though, it's not even necessary to do that because their, their goal is not to hold on to it, to have it insured, for instance, their goal is to sell it. And so what I then do is I'll bring in, um, you know, I'll speak to some auction houses. If the auction is appropriate way to go, sometimes a, selling directly through a gallery is the best way to go. I'll help them with that. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I'll just say, listen, there's really not much here that's worth insuring or selling. You should just probably donate it. And I'll just give them recommendations on how to donate it. Um, but every situation is unique because people collect different types of material and people have different situations, you know, as to whether or not they want to sell or they want to, you know, um, donate it or they just want to, you know, maybe gift in the family, but make sure that they're... <clears throat> gifting the appropriate value amount and not leaving anybody out. You know, that's, that's, that gets to be more of an issue usually with jewelry. And I have a jewelry specialist who does an amazing job. And basically what we've done in situations, it's like we put in, we assign a value for the jewelry, a value for their art, and then hopefully they're equal so that everybody who gets distributed. And that's, that's when you're dealing with equitable distribution in an estate situation where everyone wants to feel like they receive an equal monetary amount. The trouble is that there's very often a sentimental attachment to something. Right. And too many people want the thing because of the sentimental attachment, but that's really hard to put a value on. So we try to just break it down to like, well, this is the monetary value. And I, I know it has a sentimental value to you, but we can't let that creep into the situation because that's that's too hard to, to put a value on. Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to expand this, the, the conversation of, whether it's, let's say, an, a piece of art, and art is now wider, most people will think of a painting. Mm -hmm. Some people may think of maybe it's a sculpture. Maybe some people are thinking, um, even like you said, like a photograph or mm -hmm. done by, you know, let's say, like um, something from my, my grandparents and when they were married or something like that. And of course, they would at this point be more than a hundred years old. So if I had a photograph, that would just be amazing, which I don't think right. I have, but um, so that I want to expand that mm -hmm. now that art has taken on other different forms. And so we were talking about collector's items. We right. were talking about sports memorabilia. Mm -hmm. As soon as you said sports memorabilia. And so most people will be thinking of like playing cards or if people still have collections of, of, um, of like baseball cards. I have yes. some people who are probably watching who are comic book. Mm -hmm. They go to Comic-Con yeah. every yeah. year. If you're yeah. here, drop it in the comment because I know you. <laughs> you know, 
or or people who are now into clothing. Yeah. So if it's vintage clothing or if it's um, and I'm going to uh, I'll like shoes, mm-hmm. costume jewelry, mm-hmm. um, like hair pieces. There are these uh, some beautiful women who are in my life and who have just sort of passed on, but they were collectors of brooches, mm-hmm. gorgeous brooches. And I'm just like, I know. And I know a number of them are like sterling silver or um What's the, it'll come to me. What's the um, the image of like the woman facing to the side and it's like a classic piece. Uh-huh. Like um, a cameo? Say it again. A cameo? Yes, a cameo, yeah. right. Yeah. And some beautiful um, images of those, but then let's expand it even more. So now we have like a modern, um, uh, a modern version of art of sneakers. Right. I mean, the sneakers thing, again, like that's that's a different generation. I right. mean, that's so new that and it's really more of like a, a collectibles and um, vintage clothing market. And, you know, I should add in the, the other reason why I think I got into this field is because I was obsessed with vintage clothing when I was a teenager, like mm-hmm. obsessed. And that was back in the day in New York City where you could just like walk into like a vintage clothing store and buy like an entire like wardrobe from the 50s and 60s I mean, it was so nuts this is back in the 80s and so right. you know i i totally respect what people are doing now they're sort of like they're taking things and they're recycling them they're mm-hmm. you know buying them and then selling them i think that's that's i think that's super cool and then there's like there's companies like the real real you know that's that's an amazing company and it's, it does really really good things because it's basically allowing people to say, you know what, I'm kind of sick of this. I'm never going to wear this again. I'm just going to sell it. And that's a really good thing because let's face it, you you have too much stuff. Everyone does. You know, it's like, this is a luxury <laughs> problem. We all have too much stuff. So like, why not just give it or sell it or just like move it along? Um, oh yeah, I love vintage. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Shout out to Ayana. Yeah, that's right. We love vintage. So it's yeah. not like, Victoria, where did you go look for your vintage clothing? Was it, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a Brooklynite. For us, it would be Fulton Street or maybe it was Pekin oh. Avenue, Delancey Street back in the 80s. I had two yeah. stores that I always went to. One was on the corner of Bleecker Street, and I think it was called Chameleon. Oh my. I love that store. And then there was another store called like, I think it was on Greenwich Avenue called like Star Struck or something like that. I think it's even still there. There's like some crazy, you know, things that are just still around. But I think most of them are gone because most of them, you know, people sell that stuff on eBay now or, or what have you, you know. Right. Sure. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's the, there were m- many more vintage clothing stores in the 80s in in, uh, in Manhattan. So that's what I would do. But um, but I love the fact that all that stuff is still around. You know, I mean, I found this vintage um, uh, jewelry and accessories store. It's here in Chelsea. And I found like that he had one of these rings. It's actually a, a man's ring. It's not I wear it. I gave it to my son. It's too big for him. But it's a, one of those vintage subway tokens from back when we had tokens that you would drop into the subway. It's made into a ring. It's so cool. So- <laughs> Who has a token? Who's still listen? If I dig deep enough, I actually make because of course when they said that they were leave, that you know we were no longer gonna have tokens, I actually think I still have the one with the Y in it. Oh, you can make it into a necklace. Who remembers that, right? The one yeah, with the, 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 y. With the y where it's like cut out, the cut out Y. Yeah, yeah. So you make that into a necklace, just thread a thin, you know, little, you know. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's incredible. So now let's let's sort of talk about if let's say I wanted to encourage young people, and I have a, a network of young people that are I'm gonna be feeding into even more. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh shout out NC and W. Uh I would love to encourage younger people to consider this, but here's the, here's a catch. Uh It's really encouraging the families to see this as a lucrative career for their young people. So offline, we were talking about going to museums and that love of art. There's another step. Right. Past just taking art history classes, past going to museums, how does one get into this work? I mean, you mentioned Christie's and then and I mentioned Sotheby's and I'm just like, wow. Yeah. How 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 does how does one get in there? 
How does one get into do this? Work? I think the people, the way that people get into it is just by really being passionate, whatever, whatever it is that they're passionate about. You know what I mean? Everyone has an art form that they want to learn more about, either by doing it themselves or just learning about the history and the other makers. So I think going to galleries is really important. Um, going to museums, people think that like they're not allowed to go to galleries if they're not going to buy. That is so not true. Um, people go to gallery openings all Good. the time. It's really important to go to gallery openings, not just museums. And um, there's there's a really great app that I use for finding out which galleries are near you in whatever city. It's called Seesaw. I'll type it in. You just go into the Seesaw app. It's totally free. And it just tells you in whatever city you're in what gallery openings are happening that week, what's closing that week based on the different neighborhoods. So in, in Manhattan, there's obviously plenty of different neighborhoods to see art. There's the Upper East Side, Chelsea, Lower East Side, Tribeca. And then you've got the also the the places out in Bushwick that you know that whole area Williamsburg and Bushwick also have great contemporary art galleries. So I try to encourage people to do that. Um, the other thing I think it's just really important to just have conversations, you know, about you know new trends in art. Like there's things happening with NFTs that are really exciting and really interesting. I don't know enough about it. I'm still exploring it, but I find it really really interesting. Um, but I think the other thing is, you know, getting back to like what we were talking about, like encouraging people to be a part of things. I think it's just encouraging people to have an appreciation for it on whatever level they want to have an appreciation for it. And like, I was talking to my son recently, um, because he was kind of teasing me, he's 19 and he said, Oh mom, I think I'm going to get a tattoo. And I was like, Oh really? I was like, you want some art form in your body? How about support one of your friends who's a struggling artist and give them the thousand dollars and get an actual painting out of it rather than having something tattooed in your arm that you're never going to be able to take off. I mean, where's the value in that? Say more about that. Like, I just, I just thought, I was like, it's like find an artist to support. Don't, I, I know tattoo artists are artists. I get it. But the fact is, is that there's too much focus on like these people who are getting these crazy tattoos. And I'm like, what about an actual painting? What if you commissioned something from an artist and said, make me a painting for my wall? You know, think about it that way. Yes. Like, I'm not yes. saying it's necessarily going to increase in value. I don't know that. But let's say you give like $1,000 to a struggling artist. It means so much to them. And then you have something on your wall. Right. <laughs> Rather than something yeah. stuck in your arm. Right. Well, <laughs> let, hold on. I need, I need to sip on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have we actually have a, a we have a comment, so I want to bring this up. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Ayana. So is there a major in schools or career track you can follow to get in? Yes. Into the there's there's two tracks, and very often what people do is they're either a studio art major and an art history major, one or the other too. I mean, there's plenty of people who are in this field who are you know who tried to become artists but didn't. You know, some of the best art critics are artists that just gave up. They just were like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to be an art critic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just having a really good eye, developing your eye by seeing as much as possible, having conversations constantly, reading about art constantly. And, you know, it's not even so much the, the major because, you know, frankly, art history is really, really tough in college. They put you in a dark room, you're looking at slides. I actually don't even think that that's always necessarily the best way to look at art. I think the best way to look at art is in a museum um, because then that way it's you're in front of it. You're actually experiencing it in person. That's a very, very different thing than seeing it on a screen, either a screen on your phone or a screen on, you know, in a, in a darkened room with slides and like a hundred people in the classroom or whatever. So I do encourage people to go to as many art galleries and museums as possible and to get to know artists and to ask them to go with them to galleries and museums because you see things differently through the eyes of an artist. So if you're not gonna be a studio artist yourself as a major, you can be an art history major and then just become friends with artists. That's the best way. So I've had the opportunity in the past I think I'll say I resurfaced during this summer. <laughs> I was on a plane a lot. And I am also a part of a community. And so shout out to Professor James Small and the Hoppy community who I, in I interviewed Professor James Small a couple of weeks ago. And I'm actually going to be doing so y'all stay tuned. I'm in I'm unpackaging this book from if you mm -hmm. saw my Facebook story about uh, read watching, excuse me, meeting Chester Higgins, who's a famous photographer of African yeah. uh, of art, like not art on a wall, 
going to Africa and seeing the stuff right where it was built. Okay. And so he does an amazing job. So I'm actually going to unpackage that at uh, some point soon. So y'all stay tuned. But then there, when you said like being in a dark room and like watching slides, the people who get on a plane yeah, and they go mm -hmm. and then they sit and they study or they do the research prior. And so when I hear about someone who is uh, an, an art critic, when I hear about someone who is like yourself, an appraiser, or um, someone who is a curator, in my mind, this is just me, and this is me being cynical right now. And I'm gonna say it like I would say it, because Ayana's watching. Mm -hmm. How you gonna go be a, a curator of African art, and you've never been to Africa? Right, same yeah. thing with like, let's say um, uh, uh, Chinese dynasties. Please tell me that you lived or in China or Hong Kong or Japan or something in, in terms of to do that work. Not that you have to. Oh, I know. Right. To me, when you it's speak. True. Right. To me, when yeah, you speak. You're absolutely right. Right. No, you're right. I mean, I have um, with, you know, in my company, I have somebody who does Asian works of art, you know, and he's fluent in Mandarin and Cantonese. You know, he, you go. he's going to be able to read things that I can't read, you know. And then, of course, you know, I was a you know, a language major at Connecticut College. I was a double major in French and Italian. And it was because I was obsessed with going to museums and seeing things for myself. And so I think also it does come in handy because a lot of the art that I need to, you know, a lot of the things that I need to read, either, you know, art gallery, you know, uh, reviews or anything, it's not always going to be in English. I mean, very often everything is, but it's just helpful to have that other language. And so, but I think that for the most part, it really depends on what you're, what you're interested in. I mean, I have, you know, uh, colleagues that, you know, as I said, do nothing but a very, very specific area. You know, I have somebody that I work with who does nothing but vintage couture and that's all she does. And so that's been her obsession for a long time. And so, you know, when we work on appraisals together, you know, very often the client will have like a significant handbag collection, for instance. And so she'll work on that part. And then I have somebody who does the jewelry and then I do the fine art and the rest of the contents in the home. So we all sort of break it down. It's like a triage situation where we each focus on what we're, what our focus is. So it works out. So I'm getting, I'm, I'm feeling the vibes of like NCIS. I, I love the show, but what I'm thinking is you coming in with like your magnifying glasses, like you're coming in with some catalogs, you're coming in with, you know, like uh, gloves, because of course you don't want to, you know, touch some of the old stuff. And, yeah. and th that's what I'm thinking um, in order to say, okay, hey, I know this is from this period, this is from this period, and it's worth this. So I'm actually going to mention um, a person, one of our performer professors, um, Barkley Hendricks, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He was let's say known to a part of the world when he was alive. He was known for some of his really, really um, iconic work of in, of individuals of like black art of, of um, like, uh, let's say blacks in the, in the sixties and seventies, yeah. there was some pieces that he's done of people like in Harlem and like the, Har uh, the Harlem Renaissance and, and just with some gorgeous work when he passed away. It was like he expanded times 10. Well, also what happened around the same time that he died is that people started paying more attention to African-American artists. There we and go. It's unfortunate that about. he didn't live long enough to see all of the you know, acclaim that he deserved. He, he was an amazing artist. I love his work. I loved his work You know, when I was at Connecticut College and I saw it for the first time, I was like, this is amazing. I mean, he made his his portraits, I mean, they looked like they were so regal and they looked like these Byzantine portraits from like, I mean, they were incredible and the lighting and it's just gorgeous, gorgeous work. And so I was always a really big fan of his and, um, you know, and it's, and it's, it's, it's interesting. There's another artist, similar story, although, you know, even more like greater stature than Barclay Hendricks, um, Ed Clark, another abstract expressionist who's largely ignored because being African-American, he was not given the opportunities he deserved. Mm. He studied art in Paris on the GI Bill, um, and he was an amazing artist. But you know, really, probably had a lot of you know issues in 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 the art world, in institutional racism. He actually did long live, live long enough to have his show at Hauser and Worth, which is one of the top galleries in the world here in New York. 
And, you know, at least he lived to see that. You know, that was important to him. And wait, what's the name of the place? Ed Clark. You can't miss his paintings. He would do these giant swaths of color. They're really gorgeous and they're huge. Ed, wait, I'm going to type it in. Ed Clark, yeah. Ed, C-L-A-R-K? Yeah. Is it studio? I don't know if it comes up as studio. Does it come up as studio? Uh, Maybe. I don't know. I'm just going to type it into the chat. Ed Clark, if you Google Ed Clark artist. Artist. I'll, I'll try to, you know, uh, let me just think, actually, because I can just tell you, he actually just died, I think, in um, in 21. He died pretty recently. Oh, thank you, Joshua Smith, who just dropped it in the chat. I appreciate you. Joshua Smith, who are you? Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So if you, I'm going to put it up. Great. Yeah, he died in 2019. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. So artist. D, no, artist Ed Clark, thank you, dot com. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, y'all, yeah. listen. And he was 93 when he died. 93. I mean, thank God. I think Barkley Hendrick lived, didn't live as long as he could have, unfortunately. I think he died pretty young. He did. Uh, maybe he wasn't, maybe early 60s? Yeah, maybe. That's, that's a shame. That's a shame. Maybe. And thank you so much. So, we actually have uh, uh, my big sister, Andy Scott. Annie Scott, who got me to Connecticut College. So she's on and she's watching. Thank you very much. So she's a former student of Connecticut College as well, and then came back and worked for, for Khan. So beautiful. Um, and so hopefully other people from, of course, our school will be able to see this and then shout out. Yeah. So let's let's um take it to to one more question. And that would be, and thank you for the comments who are coming. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so here's one of our classmates. Hey Rachel, let me put you up. <laughs> Hey, Rachel, one of our, um, mm -hmm. our Hendrix was amazing at helping young artists find their visual voice. Yes. To Victoria's point about understanding art through an artist's eye. Yes. 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 Excellent. Fabulous. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. So I want to, I want to talk about, um, thank you for making the point that uh, certain groups of people may not necessarily get their just due or their recognition from the, let's say, the artist world, because we're talking about art in this moment. And so one of the things that we talked about prior to hopping on is when it comes to, let's say, indigenous pieces of work. Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, okay, thank you. So actually, uh, Annie said that Barkley was 72. Thank you. Oh, okay. Still, that was too young. I think he should have lived at least until 93, the way that A. Clark did. There we he go. Enjoyed those last 20 years. There we go. Yeah, sad. Uh, so when I spoke about like indigenous works of art and if the person is, and as you brought to the stage, if the person, let's say, lives in one community but has not traveled there, how does one sort of... Uh, you know, validate, validate that where the piece is from, how, you know, how it, uh, like its impact in that community. And then it's, it's worth in another community, right? And well, yeah, I mean, I, that's actually something that I do have to focus on with my appraisals is I have to look at not only the international market, but if there is no international market, what's the national market? If there's no national market, what's the local market for the artist? Because the thing is, is that I don't necessarily, and I do have to do all this research because the thing is that the client's collection is really, really a very you know, specific collection of, around local artists in that community. I have to look at the options that, in the galleries that you know that sell that type of work it's all relevant to that marketplace and so that's something that i think that people don't always understand is that it's not going to be the same market region to region or country to country and i remember when i was working for this i was working for this um art startup and we had a lot of buyers both in the Euro in europe and we had buyers in the us and what was interesting is that the the european sellers and this was um you know a platform for art and you know vintage furniture and objects and couture what the, what i noticed is that the, the the dealers of material in the us were really focused on bringing in what was unusual and different for them so that would be european you know they wanted the french and the italian designers and it was the opposite in france they only wanted american designers it was just the weirdest thing so it's whatever is different to you what's ever not the thing that you see every day that you saw growing up in your grandmother's house, it's like weird and different and cool. That's going to have a more 
that's going to be more sought after. There's less of it in that country, so it's more rare. And so people will draw be drawn to whatever feels super rare to them, or they'll be drawn to something that just feels very relevant and very familiar to them. You just don't know because collectors are very individual people, and it's very, very hard to assign. Again, what we're talking about with sentimental value, like where's the sentimental value, your attachment to this piece because of your culture versus its value if you put it in the open market and it, and it needed to find a, a, you know, fair market value is willing buyer, willing seller. Well, if you don't have one okay. of those, then you're not going to have, a, you're not going to have an auction. You're not going to have an auction result that's like relevant to what we're trying to discover. And then of course, you've got the whole resale market, which is like, people can ask whatever they want. They can say it's, it's $100 million, but is it actually going to sell for that? So it's it's finding that happy medium of something that actually is going to go through and you know consummate as a sale, and that's that's a tricky thing. You know, it's not always so evident. It's not always so obvious because we all have to sort of figure out like what's important to us. And like again, that gets back to like what kind of conversations you're having with your kids growing up about like why is this art cool and important, and why do I personally think that a tattoo is a waste of money, but buying a painting from your struggling artist friend is a great investment. You know, like that's like, that's a good conversation to have. Maybe he won't get a tattoo now. Maybe he will. I don't care. It's up to him. He's 19. You know? is, he, is he in the kitchen? No, he's away at college. <laughs> <laughs> Let's forward this to him. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what? one of the last questions is, and I'm aware of this first and foremost because of our college. So whenever we go back to reunions, there's this conversation of estate planning. Right. And I, the first time I heard it, I guess it must've been about 20 years ago. And people were saying, what will you leave the school? Or what could you leave the school? And I'm always very enamored. I love the women from like the class of 19, like, 30 and 40, right? I, I love them. I love seeing these women who are like 90. Those of you who are from our college, our college was an all women school up until 69. The phrase is when the world changed positions, let's move on. But I love seeing these older women who I could just imagine them on our campus. But these are the women who are part of a generation where because of their choices in life and their journey in life, they either have money, they have land, or they have objects that they want to give. And if they're not giving it to their family, I never thought of giving it to your school. So I started thinking, wait a minute. And then I started seeing like the college go through renovations. And then there were these exhibits, these exhibits of things that were donated yeah. by alum. And I was like, wow. And I was thinking, what would I, what can I get? But then why are people giving? So here's the question. When people say they either want to sell or to gift, mm -hmm. or I guess the word is bequeath, right? Mm -hmm. And something, tell me about the, like the, what, what's the payoff? What's the, what's the, like, why do people do that? <laughs> and then, well, there's a lot of reasons why they do it. I mean, sometimes it's a mystery to me. I mean, I had a client reach out to me recently and she said, I'm going to donate this, you know, watercolor to, she went to Williams. She was like, in the, and Williams has an amazing, um, you know, uh, art gallery. She said, I'm going to donate this. And it, you know, I mean, it was worth like, I mean, it wasn't worth that much. It was maybe worth like $10,000. And the thing is, is that, I think she just probably was getting married and her husband hated it. He was like, I don't want to hang that on our wall. I hate it. So like, that's a great, you know, alternative. Like she didn't want to sell it, you know, like it was, okay. that, it wasn't worth it to her to sell it. She was like, why don't I just donate it? You know, I want to give them some money. I'll give them this picture that's worth like 10 grand. They'll have it in an exhibition on outsider art. It'll be super cool. And that's what she ended up doing. But then a lot of times what people have to remember is that, okay, so I had this one very, very odd estate situation where, it was uh, somebody who had been a, uh, a dealer in 19th century pictures and he gave everything. He had no children. He lived in a rent control apartment in the West village. He gave 
everything to the Met. Metropolitan Museum was going to get everything. And what they couldn't take into their, you know, museum for display, they were just going to sell at auction. They would get the money. So either way, they were going to get the money from the sale at auction or the, they were going to get the actual works. But one thing happened. They contacted me and they were like, okay, our curators have looked at this. There's this one piece that's actually a fake and we have to give it back. So that does sometimes happen, that awkward moment where you're like, oh no, it's a fake. I mean, chances are he didn't spend that much money on it. He was buying the 1960s at auction. He, he was a very savvy, shrewd buyer. Probably didn't spend that much money on it. But the thing is, is that that's where it gets really tricky. It's like they needed an appraisal. So they needed the appraisal first for estate tax purposes. And then they needed me to help organize the whole gift process to the Met. But unfortunately, out of all those things, only one thing came back, which is good. Um, and then the rest of the things we just sold at auction and it was all clean and the apartment got turned back to the landlord and renovated the whole thing. So it's like, this is what happens. It's like, it's like the turnover of stuff that people just have in their homes and it's got to find a home someplace. So now I'm going to speak to my people who are watching and I'm leaning in. Okay. Now, Ayana said, isn't it amazing when Doriel gets happy? So mm -hmm. I'm going to get excited for this moment. So I had this, um, and this actually happened in my life. So I'm speaking from literally first first person um, experience. And I know actually I have family who's watching. And so this is this is what we'll talk about. So uh, my grandparents um, had both had passed away at this time, at this moment. And we were going through, you know, going through their items and trying to decide, you know, what was going to happen and who, like sort of who was going to get what and, you um, the, the conversation never came up of let's get something appraised. Some one of our family members was like, oh, well, I think maybe that like that's kind of worth something. I'm saying to all of us here, if you've never known an appraiser before, <laughs> she's one. Right? <laughs> now I'm now I'm going to speak to two communities. I'm speaking to my uh my Caribbean community, and I'm speaking to my African American. So, if you want to talk deep South, so let's let's go back decades. Let's go back decades. If y'all know what I mean, let's go back decades, decades. If somebody in your family, through career choices, help me read between the lines, right? Career choices acquired a, a tea set, um, a dresser. I'm trying to think, uh, a, a, a photograph or mm -hmm. like an, I, I'm even going to think of hand, like hand items, let's say like a, spe a silver spoon or things like that, mm -hmm. or um, an old iron, like things that we would sort of consider period pieces. Mm -hmm. And it was held on to. Like we said at the top of the broadcast, before you throw that out or donate it or just sit it on like a shelf, or you give it to your younger generations and they clearly don't have an appreciation for right. it. Right, right. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right there. Check with the appraiser. It, <laughs> the initial, now the initial, you know, ask, and I don't know what your fee is and you, whatever, how are the, go, oh, I'm supposed to put this banner up. Sorry. Let me put the banner, the banner back up. <laughs> Please go check Victoria out. She is my classmate. She actually, it was very funny. We were, go, we were supposed to go to uh, an event for our college. And she's like, Doriel, are you going? <laughs> <laughs> are you going? And so I was like, hey, let's catch up, whatever. What are you doing? I was like, oh my gosh, you appraise art. Child, you've got to be on the show because I know nothing about art appraisals and I would love to know and I would love for other people to know. But go check with an appraiser. Again, it could be from the picture that always was in the hall, but nobody knew who that person was, but somebody was like, well, I think it's somebody in our family, or I think it's somebody that's important. Or if you have, let's say you live in a place or your family owned land, right? Somewhere. And somebody goes digging. Yeah. And, they, what happened. and they dig up something and it's like, well, what in the world is this clay pot? Child, don't throw that out. Oh, I don't don't go to the museum either. Go to a, go yeah. to an appraiser. Yeah. Or an old true. watch that was gifted, that was handed down. You know, thank God I have my grandmother's, my father's mother's ring. 
and it's just a gold band. God help, I'm taking that to somebody because it's just, yeah. of course there's sentimental value, but there's something about it, right? And so I think uh, in, in a number of families, depending on the generation, depending on where you've traveled from and traveled to, some people, of course, and if there's tragedy, right? There could be tragedy. You could have had to make, let's just call it a quick exit. Mm. Call it a quick exit. Uh, but you were able to take that one thing, a necklace that was gifted down, or again, something that said pass, give it to the person that you marry or give it to your child or whatever. Those things, that, of course, have sentimental value. There are things that we may or may not know is worth something. Yeah. It doesn't hurt yeah. to ask. It doesn't hurt to say, I got this, but I'm not sure. Now, there's I have a lot of a lot of savvy, savvy folk. Thank God for the people who invited me to a an auction, to an mm -hmm. art auction. I went to my first art auction. If y'all are from Brooklyn and Y'all from the Flatbush area, you know the Dorsey Art Gallery on Rogers Avenue. Shout out to the Dorsey family. I went to my first art auction and saw all of these Black people in this room doing as if they were at Sotheby's. Uh -huh. Literally, that whole call, 35, 35, 30, and I was like, why did you just pay $10,000 for a piece of art on a wall? $10,000. Yeah. yeah. I was amazed. So I'm, I really, really want to reiterate. If you have something that's passed down from the family or you have collected something or somebody in your family collected something, just like, don't throw that out because grandma said these are the only silver spoons she could get or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, it does happen. People do contact me mostly because they just are in a situation. They need to empty out a house and they need to just sort of figure out what to do. I mean, it really, really, it really just depends. And, yeah, and they may not have an appreciation for the art and the objects. They may not be sentimental people. We, we don't know. It doesn't matter. But it's really, really important for families to have these conversations. And then, oh, yeah, quilts. Yes, a quilt. Thank I know. There's, yeah. And there's like, you know, within the quilt community, there's like a very, very specific type of quilt, the Guise Bend quilts, you know, from that very, very specific part of Guise Bend where they, I was in the Met a few years ago, they had an exhibition just for that, you know, those, that community, you know, which is like typically like a completely ignored group of quilt makers, you know, and, you know, thank God there's organizations that are starting to like bring these types of things to light, you know, and, and, and give them the, you know, the platform that they deserve. Can you spell that? Sure. It's G G E E apostrophe S and then bend B E N D. Yeah. He's and they're African American quilt makers in the South. And all they do is this very, very specific type and style of quilt making. And it's beautiful. Excellent. Geese Ben. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much to so all my quilt makers. Thank you. And yes. actually, I have two quilt makers yes. in, exactly. my, in my family. And, yeah. you know, again, I've just, I didn't even know the world was so deep. But <laughs> yes. So tapestries, oh my goodness, tapestries, right? Yeah. Or or if you're gonna pull it, put it into couture, I don't think it would be couture because I think that's clothing. No, it's different. It's, but, it's right. different. Tapestries is different. Yeah. No, I mean, I actually had a client that I didn't um an estate tax appraisal for them, and they had these amazing 16th century Italian um textile pieces that we think were probably used as uh, chair covers but they had them framed. So they were like these incredible embro silk embroidered tapestry panels. They were really gorgeous. And they were amazing collectors. They had an eye for everything. I mean, she was a photographer, he was an architect. And so mm. typically people that are very visual will have very strong collections. That's what I've noticed. Um, not always, but, but for the most part, they'll have something where you walk in and you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know? So who, do you do books as well? I have a books person. That's yeah, books. Too difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very specific. And usually if if it's an important book collection, I mean, we're talking like 2000 books. It's it's like, it's overwhelming. It's, it's too much for me. And very often book collectors are very, very specifically oriented towards a very particular type of collection. So it's, it's very academic. It's not something I can do. Of course, if it's like just art books, that's not hard to research. I can, I can do all that. That's not, that's not a problem. So I'm I'm glad I said that. And I, I said that 
because I went to, um, and thank you, Annie Wright Tapestry. Remember seeing some of the Lyman Allen. So those of you who don't know, the Lyman Allen Museum is actually a museum that's like, I want to say off the, the road from our college in, in New London, Connecticut. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm an educator. Most of you know that I'm an educator. And so whenever I go to, I want to say older towns or, mm -hmm. uh, like let's say antique stores. I'm actually always fascinated by children's readers. Mm -hmm. The first reader that mm -hmm. would be given in our age group, it would be like the Dick and Jane, but I'm talking about stuff yeah. from let's say the forties, the thirties. Yeah. And I've actually seen, and so that's actually what I kind of collect. I'm also, I collect pennies from the still have like picture, the, like not the pictures, but the ones sent on them. So I actually have some mm -hmm. old. Um, but those things, oh yes, McGuffey. Who's McGuffey, Annie? Who's McGuffey? Mm -hmm. I don't say more, Annie. I don't know who McGuffey is. Um, but I have this fascination with very old books that have to do with it, with teaching. And so mm -hmm. I like, they're so delicate that the cover is, you know, like, Right, breaking, and the 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 um the spine is um stitched. Yeah, I love that stuff. But of course, you know, my children are not going to appreciate that. So I'm sure. Oh, the McGuffey reader. Oh, thank you very much. The McGuffey reader is one of the first readers. Thank oh, you. okay. Yeah. And so knowing that maybe you know you have somebody that does books as well, because when I see this stuff on shelves, I'm like, does anybody recognize like how yeah. this is? And I do one of these numbers. I'm like. Right. <laughs> like you don't recognize I mean, this is what I do. I, I want to keep this up. Um, so thank you very much for, for, of course, sharing this information. So again, it could be, you know, uh, like you said, a tapestry. It could be a painting. It could be a sculpture. Yeah. It could be couture, uh, clothing. It could be, you know, there, of course, then there are people who are like, um, um, well, I'm thinking like bigger things. Let's say like furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from different places. Some people have that eye. Some people walk on, some people walk on by. Somebody yeah. write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody write that in the chat. Some people, right. Some people are born like with that eye. Some people are trained with it. And then some people like, that's old. Why would I, I don't want anything old in my house. No, I have I it. Look, and it's not for everybody. You know, it's, it's very Right. And you have to keep it up in a particular way and you can't have kids running all over it, you know. Right. So definitely, you know, you have you have to have a a, a place that will protect right. the product. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So anything else that we should know how, of course, we're going to get in touch with you by I mean, going to artappraiser.com. Yeah, I mean, people should get in touch with me. You know, people should just keep good records. They should talk to their kids about what they have. You know, they should get appraisals on a regular basis. I always tell people, you know, the best place to start is just by having an insurance appraisal. You know, at the very least, have an insurance appraisal because then that way, you know, sort of like, okay, at least like if you have like a nice engagement ring, you know, and you want to know, okay, let's at least get that taken care of because, you know, chances are, you know, we're going to, at some point, you know, we're all going to go, you know, we can't take it with us. And so like, you have to sort of have some sort of plan, like, okay, well, if the engagement ring is going to my son, because he's going to propose to his girlfriend, you know, someday, like, it's like these things you have to think about, like everything's in terms of like, oh, I want to be able to like give my grandmother's, you know, engagement ring to my, you know, future wife, you know, people like, it's gonna happen, yeah. So sure, why not? But what if the fiance hates the shape of the stone? She's like, I hate Marquis cut. You know, like you just don't know. Have a conversation now, though. It's a diamond. You're gonna be choosy about a diamond. Some people don't like Marquis cut. Marquis cut is the one where it's like really long and pointy on both ends. Yeah. There was a whole like Sex in the City episode about this. About <laughs> this woman got this engagement ring, and she was like. Thanks. <laughs> she hated it. She absolutely hated the ring. Yeah. Okay. I know. <laughs> There's things to be done. You could always take the diamond, like reset it a different way, put it into a necklace. You could figure it out. Thank you. Right. I yeah. I, I yeah, hadn't even thought about that. It's a big one. It's a, it's, it's a really, really big issue, in a, wow. especially in a state appraisal or an insurance appraisal. So, okay. So then I guess the bottom line is, let's say anything that you 
have anything that you bought? Like, who's getting the, why am I getting the appraisal? Is it because I've been gifted something or because I own something that I want to add to my insurance policy for my home in case fire, flood or whatever? Sure. Is that what yeah, you're saying? What people do is they have a general contents policy, but then anything, anything that has anything in their home that they think is a value of like, let's say $5,000 and up, have that added to your um, schedule on a rider. And then that way, at least you've got your engagement ring covered or like that necklace that your grandmother gave you that you want to make sure it's insured because God forbid there was a break in or you, you know, whatever, you know, jewelry is the, probably the most important thing to get insured because of the theft issue. Art is probably the second most important thing to get insured because of the flood issue. It's very unlikely you're going to get the painting stolen out of your home. What's more likely to happen is there's going to be a flood and it's going to get damaged that way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In fact, most of the insurance appraisals I do are because people are just terrified that their neighbors are going to flood their apartment and it's going to leak and destroy their artwork. And it happened. I mean, the, the ex CEO of Twitter got sued by this artist who lived downstairs, downstairs from him in Soho because he didn't get his leak fixed in a timely manner. He had the shower like exploding all over his apartment all day. The plumber didn't make it until like eight hours later. He destroyed an entire art collection. This woman had been an artist in the 50s and 60s, she works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She works in other museums. And she was like, that's it. My life's work is gone. I mean, eventually they settled, you know, but like these things do happen. Wow. And of course, then do not leave paintings on the floor in the basement waiting to be put up on the wall. No, it's better just hang it on, the, on your wall. It's safest on your wall in a frame. That's the safest place. You know, but take good care of things, you know. This this has actually been more inspiring than I actually thought. Because <laughs> yeah. so any tidbits that you that the people who are still here have, have gotten, go to your insurance company, get a writer, add the, you know, have you you said like a table or a contents? It's a schedule, yeah. For schedule. your for your for you'll have like a general policy and then you'll have a schedule, like an itemized list of the, maybe a few things you're going to add to it because they have a higher value than what's covered by your general contents. And the other thing I say is that if you inherit something and you hate it, you could always sell it and buy something that you love. That's or you can opinion. gift it to your universe. Yeah, or gift it. Gift it. It's, it's, you know, tangible property. You can move it along. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Look at all the people. Thank you so much. Yes, very yeah. interesting. Thank you, Brother Herbert. I appreciate you. <laughs> so that is that we will wrap up. This has been extremely amazing. Thank you, Victoria. The, Thank you the, the camel. The camel. <laughs> <laughs> Those people who are Khan College students, they understand. They I understand. Know. Um, yes, camels rock. And yes. as I always say, I where my camels at? Camels go the distance. That's right. Go oh, the distance. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you Thank to you. all who popped on today. Please share this out. Even though we are at the end, you can actually click the share button, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook. You can share it out to other people. You can tag people uh, in the video. If Again, if they have been gifted something, if you know that they have something in their house that is probably worth something and they may not understand it, if they've gotten something and you're like, you know what, go yeah. oh, check that out. No, that recently happened with that. There's a big Jacob Lawrence show that happened last year at the Met. And it was like this series of the whole, um, I think it was the migration series. Mm -hmm. Enormous giant paintings. Oh no, it was the history of the United States. There was a missing painting. Somebody realized that that, that painting that was missing was hanging on somebody's wall on the Upper West Side. They had bought it at a charity auction in the, in, the, in the 70s or 80s. They didn't even know what they had. It was a Jacob Lawrence. <laughs> I mean, it was like insane. They didn't know what they had. Wait a minute, how did they find it? How did they recognize because it? Somebody went to the show and said, oh yeah, that missing painting, the Jacob Lawrence series, because they had a blank hole and like an outline of what it should look like. They said, that looks like my friend's painting. And they said, you know, I think you might have a Jake Lawrence that's missing from that show right now at the Met. And, and they sure said, enough, they did. Do you yeah. have that painting? Yeah. And so they, I think they ended up probably selling it or donated it to the museum, probably selling it to the museum. They made a fortune. I, I, right. I wouldn't be donating anything. I would be selling How much you want it for? How much yeah. you want it to yeah. you? No, that's exactly. top numbers. 
yeah, but it, it, it worked out beautifully. And it's all because somebody went to the museum show and they just made the connection of what they had seen on their wall, How on their friend's wall. So let's all go to a museum. Yes, go to a museum. <laughs> then let's look in our attics. Let's look in our closets. Let's look in the storage facilities that we have sitting up, you know, down the block and around the corner and go check some of this stuff out. Just yeah. because it was a family member's and you've now acquired it and you don't really know what to do with it. And I love the fact that you said that if you have something and you're not really sure, but you don't like it. Yeah. Get it appraised and then sell it or gift it to somebody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then buy something that you like. Yeah, buy something you love with money. Exactly. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, folks, thank you so much. Again, this has been a Learn to Grow You moment where I plant seeds to help you grow. My name is Doriel Inez Larry. I am a class of, and I don't mind saying it, 1990. 1990 was a great year. And both Victoria and I graduated from Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut, I-95. <laughs> we are proud to have brought you this information about appraising art and making sure that the antiques that you have you know how much they are worth. Yes. Antiques, we, art, fine art, jewelry, collectible. <laughs> right. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Heather. Heather, I got to find thank out you, where Heather. you are. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Toria. Yay. Toria, tell the other camels that we were here. Okay. <laughs> Let's get some other camels on the show. I love you all, and I'll see you next time. Uh, Victoria, stay right where you are. Okay. Peace and blessings. This is a Learn to Grow You moment where I plant seeds to help you grow. And I will see you all next week. And if you have somebody else who you think should be in this seat right here, you need to let me know. We have an amazing lineup coming up of some authors. Hint, hint, because the person is on here right now. And we'll be talking about books and other topics of interest. So peace and blessings. I will see you all next time around.